everybody. Happy New Year and uh, welcome to Brand Lab, uh, the show about branding, marketing, advertising, and just about everything in between. Uh, I'm your host, Wagner Dos Santos, and this show is produced weekly Monday through Thursday. Actually, sorry, change that up. We used to be Monday through Thursday. It's actually now Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern time, and then Sundays at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. And Sunday, we do a special show uh, on a regular basis that's about uh, your website, uh, auditing your website for UI and UX, and it's called What's Wrong With My Website? Uh, pretty simple enough. And uh, this show is, uh, is done weekly um, here in front of a live streaming audience on Blab, and that would be you guys. Well, maybe not all you guys, because some, some of you guys are watching this recording. Um, but thank you very much for those of you that are here in the room uh, and those of you that are going to be watching this recording. Um, today, uh, today we're doing kind of a special episode because uh, 2016, right? We, we just started the year. Um, this is my first blab of the new year. Uh, I took a little bit of a break in the last few weeks, thought that I could just jump in and be a participant on some other blabs and um, share some commentary here and there, but I really wasn't going to host one. Instead, I decided to prepare for, for January. So this is a, a special because, as I said, Sundays we typically do the website audit. But this one I thought would be a great way to kick off the new year. And it's uh, it's about the four trends that will shape marketing in 2016. And as this was uh, recently published in Entrepreneur Magazine. So um, I'm going to go through, I don't know if any of you guys um, happened to read the article. It was a pretty straightforward article. And then uh, some way, uh, so somewhere uh, toward the end of the show, I'll put the link out for everybody so that you can have access to the article. But um, let's go ahead and just get started. I want to get started with number one. So uh, number one out of uh, all the four trends starts with, and I love this, uh, digital and mobile will no longer be standalone efforts. So this is this is what they say, and I'll, I'll kind of explain it a little further. So heading into 2016, marketers must jump on board with the notion that digital marketing and mobile marketing do not exist. It's all just marketing. And man, I say this so often, uh, anybody that's uh, heard my blabs in the past, I tell people, let's stop calling all these different uh, disciplines and segments of marketing and let's just talk about it all as marketing. There's no longer traditional, non-traditional, digital, non-digital. It's marketing. And we need to use all the tools that are available to us and all the tools and resources that are coming up, emerging and trending to accomplish our marketing goals and objectives. So uh, I love this and I'm glad that it's number one because I really, really believe if uh, you get nothing else out of this today, remember that 2016 should be the year of marketing holistically and media neutral, okay? Um, interesting stats here. 73% of U.S. households own a computer, right? That sounds pretty, with, with an internet connection, okay? Not just a computer, but with an internet connection. So that that's, uh, you know, not something far-fetched for us to understand. And then 68% of Americans own a smartphone. So... That means when you look at it, that um, if 68% of Americans own a smartphone, uh, to not make digital and mobile part of the conversation, uh, I, I think is foolish. It, it has to be a natural part. It shouldn't be, in other words, and not to belabor this number one too much, but it shouldn't just be... Um, an option. It shouldn't be an option where we say, okay, well, I think we're going to introduce some mobile marketing. No, mobile marketing has to be part of the marketing mix. Otherwise, you're losing such a large segment of the population. And as we see through this year and into following years, the trend um, and, the, and the adoption of mobile content delivery and, and, and content consumption is increasingly um, moving fast. And, and if, if you're not marketing to those individuals on their mobile devices, 
you're not going to catch them when they go to their desktop. So I think I think this one is huge. I I really I really like this a lot. And um, I'm going to go to number two. Um, data analysis tools will become more sophisticated. So, uh, you know, I again I I love I, I love this uh, this article uh, because it hit on four very key points, but not the not kind of the the glossy stuff that everybody else is talking about that oh you know uh, uh video social media is going to be big and you know twitter is going to be bigger but it's really talking about the the guts of what we need to know and and data analysis tools becoming more sophisticated is huge we're already seeing it and i think uh i'll be talking about this a little bit more um as we get toward the end but we Today, marketing is so much more conversion oriented, and and so I think that um, to have such uh, very sophisticated uh, tools in um, available to us, and and even greater uh, data insight and analysis, will just further assist our efforts. And um, there's. Um, I'll go ahead and say this about conversion that a lot of times we we talk about conversion marketing and conversion optimization and we think about it in the digital sense and we're uh, we're tracking the lead sales funnel through conversion and it's all online based but what we forget is that yeah digital and online is great I'm a huge advocate I'm a big digital geek but we still live in an offline world too and so if we're not looking at offline conversions, we're missing a very big part of the puzzle. A conversion is a conversion. It again, just like I said in number one, that's not digital marketing. It's not non-traditional marketing. It's just marketing. So the same thing is true of conversion and analysis. We need to be analyzing everything. An entry point may come in through online, but it may come in through offline. And so all of that's important. And it's great that these tools are becoming more and more sophisticated. Uh, more integrated and more accessible um, for your efforts. So that is number two. Number three, marketing strategies will reflect a multi-touch, multi-stage customer journey. Um, I think this one's interesting because um, it's interesting to me that we're talking about it as a trend in 2016, because I'm thinking if you're not already putting something like this in place, what are you doing? You you should have some kind of a, a multi-touch program and customer journey program put in place as part of that funnel, as part of that journey from lead acquisition to conversion. And so great that that it's here, that it's a it's a trend. I I would like to think that a lot of you jumped on this bandwagon a long time ago because it's very important. And so for those of you that uh, may not be familiar with uh, what a what a customer journey or a consumer journey is. It's it's um, it's very much the way it sounds. It's it's tracking the pathway from the very entry point of a consumer or customer's interest all the way to the conversion. And that conversion can be many things depending on your business, depending on your goals and objectives. Uh, it can be anything from uh, getting more uh, signups or downloads for something, a purchase of a product or products, um, subscriptions, the list goes on. So whatever that conversion is, it's creating a journey, not only to that conversion, but for repeated conver conversions. Um, having a customer for life, having a customer that comes back uh, often is the key. You don't want that just one conversion or that one sale, but you want a repeated uh, customer loyalty. You also want advocacy and you want ambassadorship. So having a customer or a consumer uh, or whomever that audience is that is so loyal and believes in you so much that they want to go and evangelize the message that you have, then you have now just further amplified your marketing and communication efforts. Um, and that also plays a great part in developing a customer journey. Because now, if you were to draw a customer journey, maybe we'll talk about this even in greater detail later in the year, because it'd be probably a very interesting discussion uh, to have with a lot of you. But you can then look at how that customer journey also 
uh, created webs to other customers in their journeys. So, um, so that's, that's really big. Um, can't stress enough that if you haven't done so already, you should build and sketch out, if you will, a, a mind map of sorts that, that shows what that customer journey would look like for you and then put that into your plan. Um, and so uh, number four, and this is where maybe I'll go back to conversion a little bit, but number four is advanced CRM tools and features will emerge. Um, such an important a part, of course, of all your marketing efforts is going to be to close, to convert. And I tell clients um, often at, uh, for those of you that don't know, um, I head up strategy and insights for uh, an ad and marketing agency called Big Eye that's uh, based out of uh, Orlando, Florida. And one of the things that I talk to clients about is creating an integrated conversion marketing program that doesn't just look at uh, cultivating and driving in uh, qualified traffic and then, you know, converting them on a website or offline into a brick and mortar store. But then what are we going to do in terms of integrating them into some sort of a CRM? First question I ask them is, do you have a CRM? And if you don't have a CRM in place, let's talk about that. Because uh, even though I'm not doing business planning for them or sales, um, I think it's an important part of our collective efforts to make sure that they have a good CRM program in place so they can really justify their marketing expenses and determine, or, or rather, um, not only determine ROI on what, they, what they've what done, but also um, be able to uh, truly manage the, the, the quality, quality leads that they brought in. So um, I, I think it's great that they're talking about uh, advanced CRM tools um, that will uh, that will emerge. Um, I think that there are a lot of great ones out there already. Um, I use one at the agency that uh, seems to work really well for us. That's called Insightly. Um, I know a lot of people have great success with uh, uh, with tools like um, Salesforce and um, a, a variety of others. And there's all sorts of packages out there. PipeDrive, um, I think, is another one. Um, so I think that. Um, Having having some kind of a tool like that and putting it into place would be uh, would be huge. So um, let's see if there's anything else that they say here. But uh, just that in the coming year, more tools will develop uh, functionality to address the data loss that many businesses experience. New features and integration will allow marketers to track lead sources and see that information in a sales CRM. And this will help marketers better scale their highest performing campaigns, and it will bridge the gap between marketing and the sales team. So, um, so yeah, um, I am, I'm gonna open up the seats here. And uh, for anybody that wants to jump in, I know that we said that we were gonna open up the seats a little bit later, but uh, I'm open to, I'm open to opening up the seats uh, earlier. So if anybody wants to, to jump in, please feel free. Uh, if you have uh, a, a comment, question, uh, just want to participate and talk about how you've applied uh, some of these tactics already and, uh, and strategies. And, uh, uh, and also, if you want to talk about what, um, what it looks like for you in 2016 in terms of uh, applying uh, and, and identifying trends. So, so again, uh, oh, um, I will also provide you guys uh, with the link to the article. All right, and I'll do this one more time a little bit later. So there you go. That is a link to the entrepreneur.com article so that you don't think I made this up. It really was there. Um, so anyway, don't be shy. We have an open seat. Love to have you come on. Um, and uh, as long as your, uh, your video and audio enabled, uh, please come by and, uh, and say hello. Um, so I will, uh, in the meantime, and we got Andrea, Andrea, sorry, geez, I can't believe I just said that Andrea coming in and, uh, I'm just going to go over the top four again to make sure everybody got it. Number one, digital and mobile will no longer be standalone efforts. Number two, data analysis tools will become more sophisticated. Number three, marketing strategies will reflect a multi-touch, multi-stage customer journey. And number four, 
advanced CRM tools and features will emerge. So there you go. Andrea, how you doing? Hi, Wagner. I still have to remember it. Wagner. <laughs> well, that's okay. I messed up your name for a second there. I think yeah. I said Andrea. I was like, ah, I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> it's okay. It happens. It's a force to have it, I guess. Um, <laughs> but I love, I love this topic and I love, I haven't like taken the time to actually read through all the like specific details that you're addressing. But I would say definitely for me, one of the most important aspects is the CRM and the multi-touch, multi multi-stage journey. Personally, I think most of the time we use, especially on a smaller level, a smaller scale, which maybe people might have some difficulty sort of, um, what is the word, relating to, especially mm -hmm. if you're maybe one or two person firm or agency or you're um, a freelancer or contractor, right. is there are tools and resources that larger agencies use and then there are some sort of the comparable alternatives for smaller agencies or smaller one person companies and um right but even at that level we leave a lot of money on the table when we're not thinking about leading, nurturing when we're not thinking about where our customers are actually coming from because that segmentation says that for example maybe an offline event, maybe a meetup was more profitable than um, those 20 hours that you were spending creating content for Pinterest. Mm -hmm. And if we don't understand where we're getting the most value from, then we can't sort of input more value in that segment as opposed to, you know, it's a, it's sort of um, a, a division of resources. Where do we want to spend the most time? And how do we find out what question do we ask to ensure that we are spending that right amount of time in the place that it needs to be put? Yeah. No, I, that's a, that's a great point. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I think also some of the other things I was talking about in terms of creating, um, you know, the customer journey, um, how, how do you create a multi-touch program or a customer journey if you don't have a CRM in place, you know, it, you're, mm -hmm. you're not going to be consistent. You're not going to be on a schedule because you don't have a good organization system. I guess you could try to create a spreadsheet, you know, and you could do something like that. Um, but at some point, um, that's not going to be as organized. Uh, Rocco says he uses uh, something called Sage, which mm -hmm. uh, I'm not familiar with. I don't know if you are, Andrea. But um, I don't use Sage, but I would say something that's most familiar for me. Sort of, you can use you can use stuff like um, excuse me, stuff that was so. Um, okay. <laughs> stuff. Yeah, you can use this kind of stuff. Um, you know, um, you know, one one that's very common. Yeah, is Infusionsoft as I well as Infusionsoft, um, yeah. HubSpot does it very well. Then you can yeah. use different sort of email marketing tools like Aweber to create, and this is sort of a manual creation of your segmentation, especially on a small level if you're just trying to build a list. Not Mailchimp. Yeah not work it doesn't work no. yeah yeah don't use mailchimp so <laughs> uh, <laughs> not for a crm at least <laughs> yeah um wordpress is a good crm if you find the right um tools to sort of yep. integrate it with um so wordpress is a good crm and technically that's what it is a content you know mm -hmm. management system so <laughs> well and and uh, oh i'll let rocco jump in here too so while he's being Rocco's... sarcastic <laughs> we, we know rocco we know <laughs> Hey, hold on one second, Rock. I'm going to answer, and, and you guys can join me in this too, answer uh, Chuck's question, uh, asking, can you give some specific examples of how one would use a CRM? And I think Andrea kind of started unpacking some of that. And, mm -hmm. you know, a CRM at, at its very uh, basic uh, level is holding, um, hey, don't go away, Rocco, come back. Um, <laughs> at, at, at its most ba basic level, it's um and and yes i, I know that uh andrea said cms i think she meant to say crm but um but yes at a most basic level it is holding your your leads and organizing the uh the different categories and managing uh your leads and their uh their information and how they came in and and the efforts of your work uh then deeper than that your your crm uh because it is holding all that data and because it has the ability, if you have a good CRM, has the ability for you to categorize and set uh, pipeline stages and funnels and all that, you mm -hmm. can now um, see what stage they're at, what you need to do for them at that stage, and then what are the anticipated stages that they're going to go into. So, for example, you know, 
um, I have my pipeline stages set up so that I have a, an entry point of evaluation. So I'm evaluating whether this lead is something I want. Yes, I'm, a, I'm an ad marketing agency, but it doesn't mean everybody that comes my way I want as a client. So mm -hmm. I'm evaluating them as much as they're evaluating me. And then after that, I go into proposal process and then I go into a pitch process and then a multi-touch follow-up. Instead of me saying, sending emails uh, to my prospective clients saying, hey, are you signing yet? Hey, you signing yet? Hey, you signing yet? Um, mm -hmm. Instead, I'm sending them emails like, hey, I saw this great article that just came up in blah, blah, blah about your industry. And I think it's so interesting how there's a, a trend in this thing, blah, blah, blah. So I thought of you. Uh, mm -hmm. So, hey, hope everything's uh, going along well with your with the proposal. That's it. And then maybe I'll have a blog article that I send them. So that's part of the multi-touch program. But I can't remember all those things. And I don't want to go ahead and resend a, a blog article, resend something else. So my CRM keeps me honest and keeps me organized. Mm -hmm. Right? What, what do you think, Andrea? Well, I, I mean, I agree. And this is sort of one of the reasons why I think, well, CMS and CRM are separate. But in the actuality, the way we look at it in terms of inbound marketing, they're basically one holistic view because what you put out there in terms of content and how you manage that funnel process is very important. From the entry point to the upsell to evaluating the lifetime value of that customer. So our blogs or our articles or things of that nature become part of this um, CRM, <laughs> yes. which it's, the separateness is also, just a way for most of us to, to define what we're actually doing and this system or that it's encompassing, but in reality, they're all working holistically together. So, right. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And, and um, um, someone here was talking about ClickFunnels. Uh, ClickFunnels is an example of mm -hmm. uh, an automated tool, kind of like HubSpot has full marketing automation. And a lot of those things are great. And I would say that one... Uh, instead of, and this goes with anything, instead of looking at tactics, we always have to think strategically first, right? Strategy yeah. first, tactics second. So click follow and all these other things are great tools and tactics but for certain people, not for everybody. For example, ClickFunnels wouldn't work for me because it's great for someone that is like really pushing pushing sales and is trying to be really aggressive with um converting someone into a sale or converting someone into uh, a subscription. But for me, who's looking to develop business and cultivate clients, I don't mm -hmm. want to take such a, uh, for lack of a better term, such a commercial approach. I want to take mm -hmm. a, a more personal approach with, you know, gradually building them and developing them into a client. So I wouldn't use a, a click phones, but somebody else would, somebody else who uh, maybe is, um, you know, trying to get um, people to buy their book or or um, doing a lot of speaking engagements uh, or, uh, you know, some other. I sales. mean, I, I have ClickFunnels. I use it um, on occasion. Um, but ClickFunnels is for a very specific purpose. It's for automation. So if you have an evergreen product that you just kind of want to promote, just like Wagner said, a book or maybe a membership site or something along that nature, it's a very sort of convenient way to get something up quickly and just have it done and have it there. Um, but for that interpersonal relationship building, if I'm going to take on a client that's a $50,000 contract or someone at that level, I wouldn't necessarily even direct them to a ClickFunnel link. Why, for what purpose? I would right. get on the phone, I would talk to them, I would go meet them. So the process, that segmentation, if you're doing more than one thing or creating more than one effort, you need to be very cognizant about how you're directing people through your funnel as opposed and where you're directing them to so absolutely no that's well yeah. said what what do you think um you know going back to the number one uh part of the the four trends i read the digital and mobile will no longer be standalone efforts that it's all marketing what do you think about that idea it is all marketing actually because if you just look at the sort of responsiveness of a website. Now, if you're choosing between desktop and mobile, you're leaving either one or the other on the table. So that's the whole reason why we're like, the trend is forget desktop, or forget mobile, just go responsive. So that we're taking on every aspect of the marketing funnel as opposed to just one. However, when you're looking at marketing for a specific niche or a specific purpose, like onboarding for an application or 
um, maybe something that requires the use of a desktop like lab, mm -hmm. um, you know, and for it's the intended purpose of it to be, you have its full use is what I'm saying. Sure. Um, depending on what the intended purpose is, the end result, you're going to reverse um, engineer that process and what fits best for you. But ultimately, yeah. for more exposure and to properly segment your market, properly ensure that you have the right stats for testing first. So yes. you want to integrate all aspects, not just digital, not just traditional, not just mobile, but everything, you know. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's kind of what the the article was getting at and and some other articles that I've read before is that we've been in the last several years, I'd say probably the last 10 years or so, we've been so accustomed to siloing all these different um, disciplines and saying, you know, you, I hear it with, with prospective clients too. They'll come in and say, well, all I really want, I'm looking for someone just to help us with digital. And, uh, and, and I try my best in a very professional and polite way to take them back and say, okay, before we jump right into this, what is it that you're trying to do? You know, what, what's, what's the, what's the pain point? What's the challenge? What are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? Let's talk about that. Cause you know what? Maybe after that discussion, I might find out that digital is not what they need, you know? <laughs> right? Exactly. And so they come in with this like, oh, we need digital or no, you know what? We need outdoor advertising. And those are, those are wants and not necessarily needs. Sometimes they don't know what they need. Um, and I think it's, it's, um, it's what this, um, this article is, is kind of demonstrating this, this push for this new attitude that, you know what, let's look at everything as marketing. Let's just say, okay, yes, we know we have social, we have live streaming, we have, um, uh, you know, blogs, we have, we have, uh, you know, we have outdoor, we have all these different uh, radio, television, we have all these different ways of, of communicating. So let's not talk about them in different segments and silos. Let's mm -hmm. just say, hey, we need to do marketing and we need yeah. to look at the behaviors, the interests of people, the demographics, the psychographics. And then from there, <laughs> think about what to do, right? I mean, this is one point that really upsets me. And I'm just like this heated passion um, <laughs> behind because I deal a lot with people or traditional business, brick and mortar businesses offline. And they'll come saying, I need an app or I need a website or I need this and I need that or I want to use um, location based services or these different aspects and they're watching something on the internet, the internet saying that everyone needs an app and some random consultant walks into their offices and see, here's what I can do for you. Why do you need it? Yes. Sometimes there are instances in which a business who is selling chicken doesn't need an application for what purpose, you know, for you just people. And I think this is a problem that like, I'm sorry, I'm getting upset. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is, I have some this tissues, is, wait. This is like, yeah, I'm about to cry. <laughs> this is a problem with marketers in general, digital marketers trying to sort of bamboozle traditional businesses in, into saying, you need to pay us $100,000 for an app you don't need that's not going to generate you any revenue. Why? Right. right. Yep. I, I, yeah. I agree with you. And, and um, and I'll tell you this that I, I tell people often. And again, for anybody that doesn't know me, I'm a big digital geek, huge. Mm -hmm. And and so for me to say this, it's for me to be very subjective. I'm I really believe that um, you know a lot of digital agencies, for example, that um, I don't know about out there, but definitely uh, here in um, uh, you know within within our area, the the digital agencies that uh, have kind of been born, they were born out of being digital production shops. They were, mm -hmm. they weren't digital marketers ever. They were interactive uh, companies and they built web applications. They would build websites uh, and then later mobile apps. And as um, there was a greater demand to advertise and market on, on those platforms, they decided, oh, you know what? Agencies, uh, traditional agencies aren't able to do this. So we're going to do marketing now, too. So they didn't come from the marketing mindset. They came from the, the development, the dev uh, mindset. And so mm -hmm. a lot of times these digital marketing shops will approach it as, oh, yeah, we need to build you an app. Why? Because they have a bunch of app developers that are on payroll that they need to pay. And if you don't do an app with them, they're going to have to send them off and lay them off. <laughs> so, and I think that's sad. Uh, I, I believe in, in more of the integrated agency model where you, you, you're well spread out so that you're not trying to sell 
your clients any one thing. You're trying to get them to where they really need. Because I, I tell clients sometimes, they say, you know, people have been saying that we need an app. So I, I start talking to them about their business and I say, well, you really don't need an app. You really just need a responsive site because mm -hmm. they don't understand that um, there are tons of apps out there and people are very... Um, selective about the apps that reside on their mobile devices. They I was have, just saying that. I was right? just saying that. <laughs> if there was a way to just not have someone download an app and just say agree, send me a pop-up notification or a push notification, then yeah. that might be even more feasible in terms of, but again, location-based services. But yeah. how much space do you have on your phone? Not literally scrolling through and say, oh, there's empty space. That's not it. It's sure. how much. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sure. How many times do you... Right. How many times do you close out some apps that you're like, uh, I never use this right? all the time, all the time. So it's about what is valuable to that specific user. Are they going to spend, you know, years or months or years keeping that on their phone? Right. And that's a major consideration because you just spent even at minimum for a viable product, maybe $50,000 or, you know, a, a sample, maybe 5,000 if you outsourced it and did it sort of piecemeal. You just right. spent a huge chunk of money and nobody's keeping that thing on their phone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that it's um, in general, I, I tell people that when we, when we market in today's uh, world, we need to be very, um, uh, very understanding and very courteous of people and what their needs and their wants are, not just our self-serving needs and wants. It's not about, oh, I want to create an app. It's about, does your audience want an app? Do they mm -hmm. need an app? And if they don't, then why are you going to do it? You know, does it serve a greater purpose or does it serve as such a singular purpose and not, and not potentially, it won't be potentially used on such a regular basis that it's just noise. So I, I think, yeah, so I, I'm right with you there, Andrea. Mm -hmm. I, I, I tackle that all the time because it's one of those shiny new toy things that people, ooh, an app, an app. I want to develop an app. And there are all these tools online now that you can kind of do it yourself a little bit. So everybody's trying to create their own app, you know? For, for, it has to have a major purpose. It just, it just has to have, it serves a purpose, serves a need. And for me, if it's not either onboarding more people into your service, your product, or exposing your product in a way that's converting into more money or more revenue for your business, then it's very unnecessary. Yeah. So, so lean, that's why we embrace the lean concept so much is terms of validation first, not, not what I want. Like you said, it's not what I want. It's what the market wants, what my segment wants. And if I can't get that validation, then there's no true cause or push for me to do it because it yes. doesn't exist. Right. Well, you know, what was interesting that um and of course entrepreneur tried to keep it to just four four points four trends but mm -hmm. if we were to add a fifth or a six one of the things that we could talk about is um the uh the next evolution of next evolution of social media and social marketing um and uh, and i i don't even mean social media marketing but even social marketing and how how to market um toward and within people's social communities, whether online or offline. And mm -hmm. I think that um, as we're seeing with platforms like Blab, like Periscope, Meerkat, um, you know, uh, podcasts are coming back up into, into interest again, something that we've had for so many years and was kind of a cult kind of thing. Now it's becoming mm -hmm. part of the mainstream. And so the way that people are consuming content is ever growing um, within these platforms and diminishing through traditional broadcasts, TV networks and cable people. Mm -hmm. There's some people that I talk to that tell me that, you know, they barely watch TV. They're, they're usually um, either scoping or they're, you know, or, or listening to a podcast and right. So don't ask me about zero movies or zero TV series. I, none of that. Like <laughs> anytime you say, did you watch this movie? It's no, I didn't watch it. I will sit there silent. I don't even watch trailers unless it's online and unless it's within my sphere. I try to be a general generalist and watch the news on occasion to know what's going on, but I don't really like watching the news in general because it's that pessimistic negative attitude or negative media. And so I try to surround myself with a very tight group of people who talk about things that I'm interested in and who are in an essence an influencer, which right. is the importance of branding. So and i and i think that's great that you do that and because uh 
it's it's so easy to get yourself lost in in TV wasteland. And mm-hmm. uh, and what you're doing is just enriching, you know, your your intelligence, your career, your you know, your 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 personal brand. So by doing that that kind of stuff, I mean it's it's only further in that. But it depends. Everybody's different, right? Some people don't aren't stimulated in that way, but mm-hmm. I know that you are. So I think that's great. Yeah, definitely. I'm a more cerebral than less, I would say. Yes, so. I know. No, that's <laughs> That's yeah. good. But yeah, I think that that would be another another big trend is that um, we're now that uh, I don't know what your thoughts about Facebook Live. I haven't played around with it too much because I'm really waiting for it to be available on my um, public um, public figure profile that I have on Facebook because I try mm-hmm. to keep my personal. I don't know if you've heard me say this before, but I try to keep my personal Facebook separate from my public profile Facebook Mm -hmm. because I don't want to alienate my friends who are just listening to all this marketing talk and stuff that bores them. Because I've I've heard that before years ago when I used to do social media incorrectly. And they used Mm -hmm. to say, listen, I'm not uh, I'm not liking you or your friend on Facebook to hear all this crap. I just want to see want to talk about some nonsense, see some pictures, you know, Mm -hmm, exactly (laughs) separate so i haven't played so i didn't play with facebook live yet because uh i probably do something non-business oriented probably but i really want to play (laughs) with it when it moves to uh to all the pages you know and it 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 opens up i know that gary vaynerchuk has uh has had some real successful uh facebook live sessions so i don't know i mean i've seen i've seen robert kiyosaki doing it um no Guy, Kyo, Guy. Kyo, Guy Kawasaki. Kawasaki, yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. In Hawaii, I've seen him do that. Um, and some people who also are going from Periscope back to Facebook. I haven't done it myself, to be honest with you. I think there's just a lot of live streaming going on. And I like focusing on specific areas. Right. But, I, I agree. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a little taxing. But it speaks to the power of live streaming. It speaks to the power of brand influencers that people who are actually living their daily lives, doing things like traveling, and that's what they do, or they're local celebrities, and that's what they do. And they have the influence over the people in their sphere, their circle, because now that the internet is so vast, it's so huge, we want to know how are we actually going to effectively reach the people we need to reach, and that comes from influence. Yes, I I agree. You know, (laughs) I, I was invited... Um, locally, um, one of the cable providers invited me to their fall showcase uh, last year, and mm-hmm. the big push was on all these reality TV programs, mm-hmm. and a lot of these reality TV stars were there, and, and kind of like you, I, I don't I don't watch too much, and sometimes I'll catch things on Netflix or on Hulu, but I I don't I haven't had TV or cable in years. And, um, and I definitely am not a big reality TV person. So I didn't know any of these people, but apparently they were big. And it was interesting that there was no one there from like a traditional, you know, TV sitcom or anything. I mean, these are all reality TV people. These are all people like you and me that became famous because they're being uh, themselves. <laughs> yeah, they're just being themselves or exaggerated mm-hmm. versions of themselves, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, but the same thing is happening online with all these platforms. You see people that have such a big following on Periscope and many of whom will be going to uh, Paris- Periscope Summit. And um, I, one that comes uh, off the top of my head, I forget her last name, but Charlene, if you're familiar with her or if anybody here in this room is. Uh, the one on Blab, the mastermind. Um, I think she might also be a Blab. I know she's definitely on Periscope a lot. And she has mm. a big following, a uh, blonde haired uh, woman, big, big personality. Um, but she's uh, uh, very successful, very well followed. And she's the type of person that, um, you know, would walk the streets and people would point and be like, hey, I know you probably even want her autograph. And it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting to see that that's where we've gone now, um, where where people now, are, you know, anybody can have their 15 minutes or more of fame. Uh, thanks to the internet and thanks to all these platforms that are out there. So, I mean, I think that uh, one of the growing trends for 2016 is going to be an increase in opportunities for people to become their own celebrities. It's the influencer market. Um, I mean, if I were um, a big media agency Mm -hmm. and I wanted to add an additional revenue stream to my (laughs) portfolio, what I would do is say, 
Hey, we're in talent acquisition and we're going to help you, XYZ company, gain traction for your product, finding the appropriate influencer for your product or service. And that's better than advertising. That's someone on the payroll being themselves talking about this product or this service or this company. My broadcasts and my streams are sponsored by them. Yes, right. Every day, every day, 100,000 people seeing advertising that can actually be tracked with a link or with a sale. And I think that's an amazing opportunity for a lot of media agencies right now. I agree. You know, Joshua kind of on that is saying that fame does not equal success and that celebrity doesn't mean monetization. And I totally mm -hmm. agree with that. But what I would say is that um, it doesn't until you do make it into monetization and until you do convert it to success. It's kind of like when you look at any of these social media platforms that started like Facebook, like Twitter, all of them started as free platforms with no monetization model. Did they, mm -hmm. did they plan to eventually have a monetization model? Of course, but they needed to create value. And so they needed to get the value was the audience. It's all of us that's on there communicating, that have pages. We're the ones that created value for those platforms to then them having the ability to go out and seek advertising. So I think it's the same with all these you know, YouTubers, Periscopers, everybody else. Sure, they can amass a great following and fame, but it only becomes successful once they got to that golden number, if you will, to where they can convert it into advertising or selling of their books or going on the road. And there's some food bloggers I know that uh, they're on the road all the time. They get a free hotel, free dinners, um, so uh, they don't have to pay for anything and they get paid for speaking engagements. So, so I think that's how you do it. Yeah, I mean, Joshua, Joshua said they had models, but they didn't implement them immediately. I mean, every business who is serious about person or still serious about getting into business should have some form of a revenue model. And I think that's a, um, a serious sort of topic right now, especially Harvard, Harvard Business Review was exploring business models or revenue models. Um, but the key point there is it's just an idea. And at some point, based on the maturity of your product, service, or online presence or whatnot, yeah, you're going to have to pivot and find what works for you. And it's probably the reason why they wait for it to mature and to have that, like Wagner said, that golden number. Or Wagner, I can't believe, I can't believe I did it again. <laughs> That's okay, um, <laughs> Andrea. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, change, be, flex be flexible, pivot. Um, yeah, it's just the expectation. You go in with a different uh, sort of an idea, but once that product service website application has reached its peak or reached a certain expectation for you, then you can say, how are the people using my presence or using my application or using my website? And what would be of most value to them? I mean, what's that, like, for example, WhatsApp, I think um, there's such a huge platform and what do they, they're asking you to pay what one dollar or ten dollars to make calls or something of that nature mm -hmm. and to make phone calls yeah, and right that sort of fell for me personally i said that doesn't make any sense because why would i use that if there's so many a million plus options that allow me to do that yeah yeah right. Right. so that was sort of the desperation of i we want to stay here and find out what it is that we need to do um and so i mean yeah, no, yeah, you're right. And Joshua was also saying uh, his wife um, is a professional blogger and she mm -hmm. didn't monetize for 18 months, uh, but there were plans too early on. And I, you know, I think that it's um, without knowing um, your wife's um, blog or, or business plan that she had, you know, it's like any business. I think uh, people have um, people have very well executed plans some some not so well executed uh there are other circumstances some that sometimes get in the way of even the best um uh best laid plans best laid plans exactly <laughs> yeah, so like so all, all, all those things come into play it's like any business and um there needs to be a very well thought out very uh very much written out uh business plan even for in a, i don't think in the in previous years it's been as common for bloggers and uh, video bloggers and and uh, video stream uh, people to 
um, to actually create a business plan. They were just like, hey, I'm just going to go on there, do my thing and gain a following. And hey, it'd be great if I could tie that into some kind of monetization. So that kind of that kind of plan is a non-plan. So what you need to do is say, okay, I'm going to build a following. I'm going to build it to such point. And at this point, that's when I'm going to start talking about, and I'm going to talk about a book. I'm going to start writing a book, or I'm going to start uh, promoting speaking engagements or seminars or webinars. And, you know, if you have a plan like that laid out with a timeline, I think mm -hmm. that's when it gets real, you know? Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, there's a lot of um, examples of celebrities offline who have taken their book online and thought they were going to have instant fame because they thought instantly, once I put a book on Amazon, I'm going to sell this this many millions of books, right, on Kindle or whatnot. And it didn't happen. The reason it didn't happen is because when they didn't build a following online, there's no validation for what the online market actually wants. What does it want? And they didn't take the time to one, just ask the question. First, build your community and find out what is it that they want? What do they actually want? And if you don't have that community online who is eventually going to be your buying segment or your customers or your clients, how do you know if you never ask them that question? I mean, you can do research of the wazoo, but if you don't ever ask the question to the people who are going to be buying from you, you won't ever know. Yeah. I agree. Uh, Patricia, what, what books do you see at the discount stores? What, what Andrea is talking about? <laughs> yeah, she sees those books at the dollar. Exactly. <laughs> they just didn't make it. They didn't make the cut and they thought they would because they were operating on a very, as Wagner said, that, that segmented marketing platform where it's just traditional, where it's just digital. And it's not the same anymore. You have to have this holistic view of wanting to sell product, wanting to sell books, yeah, whatever it might be, you have to have that holistic view. Yeah. You know, I, I would, I would love to add to this, uh, to this trend list, you know, that, that people should this year w w in whatever business that they're in or whatever, uh, level of work that they're doing to focus on the true needs and wants of their audience really take some time. This is the start of a new year. And even if you have a, an existing business or, or product, or if you don't and you're about to establish one, really take a lot of time to think about what did they really need? Not what I want, okay? What I want, you know, is I want to make money and I want to be able to sustain my lifestyle and all that. So, and there's some things that maybe I would like to do in that process, but maybe the way I want to do it isn't going to serve the needs and wants of people. And if it doesn't, ultimately, I'm not going to be successful. So mm -hmm. I think this year, if people can also look at, okay, really make 2016 the year of uh, providing and supplying the needs and the wants of your audience in the most sincere, relevant, and efficient way so that you can be successful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I'll look at this. Um, this is an interesting article. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look at that Thank too. Thank you, Joshua. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for providing that. <laughs> I think um, also some of, here are some actionable steps that you can do to actually discover what your audience wants. I mean, you can do something as simple as a survey on Twitter, or you can do, say, create a poll of 100 people and send them. DM, you know. Okay, so just ask the question. Um, go to your network of people who are interested or show or express interest in it. Um, use hashtags and Twitter to do your research, you know. Go to Facebook, go to LinkedIn, join the groups and ask the question. Responsive groups. It's all about asking. If you don't ask, I have, we've met people here who wanted to do a show and they asked us offline, hey, um, I want to do a show on marketing. So what do you want to do on marketing? Um, I don't know. What should I do? Did you ask anyone yet? No. So their idea was they would say, I just want to do the show and then I'll see if people like it. Why don't you do the reverse and find out what people like and then do that show? They're like, really? Right. Okay. 
<laughs> and it's a simple, very simple survey, very simple ass process. So. Yep. How about right. you? What, do you? what do you think is um, maybe a very, like an actionable step that people can take to find out what their market wants? Um, I mean, sur surveys is, is definitely a big one. And mm -hmm. um, another one is, is really as simple as listening, as uh, consuming as much um, reading and, and data consumption as you can from whatever, you, whatever your, your platform is or, or your vehicle. If it's uh, reading articles through, you know, Flipboard, or mm -hmm. if you're, uh, if you have lists, uh, news lists like I do on Twitter, where I get uh, AP, Forbes, uh, a whole bunch of other um, articles, and then also living. I tell I tell um, our staff at the uh, yeah I know right <laughs> actually going out and living. But I, yeah. I, I tell I tell our staff, especially our creative team at the agency, that man. And I'm not the creative director, so I'm not their boss. But I, I try to mentor some of the young ones there too, and I say, listen, you know what? Don't stay behind your iMac all day. You got to go out there and live life and experience life because that's what's going to give you inspiration. See what people are doing. See what people are really like. And and even though you read some of those articles and um, and you obtain a lot of knowledge from that, being out in the open and just observing is, is great as well. So uh, I, I'm a big, uh, I'm very intuitive as a, as a person, and I do love to observe. I'll go into a retail store. Um, or for example, one of my clients is a coffee uh, company. So I'll go to other competing coffee stores and see how customers interact, what they want, what they like, what they complain about. And I take all that information down. So uh, mm -hmm. I think, I think that's kind of important too, you know, seeing, seeing what, what's really happening out there and then answering, you know, some of those needs. I love the feedback where people are complaining or there's a problem. Yes. That to me, when someone is dissatisfied, it's the perfect opportunity to say, this is the problem. And I think, I don't know if we told you the story about Uber and um, Lyft and how Uber eventually just sold us on Lyft. We've never taken a Lyft before, refused to do it and took Uber, you know, all the time. And in that consistent asking of like, so why, how do you like Uber and how do you like Lyft? And the drivers would say, Oh, they're both good. They make us money, you know, so and so. And but you know, Uber's community is not as friendly as Lyft, and they don't pay as much as Lyft. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, this is a problem now. If Uber just fixed that, created a very, um, you know, sort of a happier, more welcoming community for their drivers. And if right. they paid them just a little bit more, you know then they would really be at the level where the drivers are happy and the driver's not selling us on Lyft, like you should go take Lyft, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. Uber's nice, but you know, Lyft is nicer to us and you want the drivers to be happy. You don't want them to sort of be upset about driving you to so-and-so location. You want them to be happy, so why not go try Lyft, you know? Yes. And uh, it's that, that little bit of feedback that says, you know, I'm completely dissatisfied with this aspect of the company. And when I can identify that point, that pain point for, you know, the company itself or the customers or whatnot, then it's like a light bulb. Oh, for and sure. I said light bulb because blue light bulb came. <laughs> <laughs> That's <was> great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should do Mad Libs with uh, with everybody's handle that comes in. Throw throw that word in there. <laughs> oh, let's try that. Um, <laughs> so, for example, like the the. Um, the product, you know, commodity, food, commodity, rice, you know, you have jasmine rice, you have long grain rice. And uh -huh. so jasmine rice, right, is something that we say, oh, you want the good rice, you go with jasmine rice, right? right. And then if you don't, you just go with the off-brand rice for Arisa rice. <laughs> right, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, Joshua, you could, uh, you, and I, I always forget if it's Josh or Joshua, which you prefer, but you should jump on in. I, we have like just a, you know, a couple minutes or so left and then we're going to close this up, but you want to uh, jump in and contribute, uh, Joshua? Okay, good. Um, so I got it right all along. Um, oh, you're not cram ready? Oh, um, cut that out. Look at me. It's like <laughs> no pressure. <though. laughs> I know it's tough with Andrea here and all her beauty, and so you uh, feel like you need hair and makeup too. But you know, <laughs> um, it's but, hey, funny because <laughs> Rocco, oh Rocco, left. It's funny. It's funny. Yeah, it came in so quickly, and then psh. he's like, "Oh, I gotta do something." Yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> oh, Rocco did some really interesting things uh, lately. So 
should connect with him as well. So. We're we're planning to uh, to connect offline for a little bit, and um, I I joined him on some blabs, and he was telling me about a few things, but then wanted to I think some of that stuff he wants to connect with me offline. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm interested in learning more. He's a he's a great great human being, great guy. Uh, yeah. I love his, love his energy. Um, but you know, J Joshua, um, he's in uh, he's in my uh, my area in uh, the Orlando market. And oh, it looks like it's gonna jump in, so I don't have to, I don't have to introduce him. He's gonna introduce himself. Interesting. <laughs> I get to meet you. Hey, <laughs> how's it going? I you mean, that camera ready. Look, can you I it? know. What is that? <laughs> I, I've been laying around all day, so you're good. Unless you <laughs> were you like nude before, you had to quickly find like a t-shirt. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, just trying to relax a little bit. So you sent that uh, that great link to that uh, that Orlando Weekly article, um, and uh, and obviously it had to do with uh, partly to do with uh, with your your very cool viral initiative. Do you want to you want to talk about that? I don't know if that uh, that story went as far as uh, Guam, where Andrea heard about it, but it did it did yeah. make it made national news. You know? Yeah, it was it was um, it got some attention. Um, so it was actually funny because two of my accounts are, are mentioned um, in, in the 25 or 30 accounts you should be following on Instagram for Orlando. Um, one of them has to do with the Orlando King Cobra that escaped and ran loose for, slithered loose for uh, 37 days. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just created an Instagram account to kind of, you know, have some fun um, and really <laughs> to, to teach some marketing lessons. So I, I teach marketing, or I was teaching marketing um, at the University of Central Florida. And um, and I was using it kind of as a, as a real time uh, case study in using social media to market a business and the strategies you can deploy in building a following and how you communicate with those people, the things you should do and things you should consider doing um, and things you should stay away from. So um, in the process of that, in the 37 days, um, I, the, that account got close to 4000 followers uh, on Instagram, um, which, you know, it's not too shabby. Um, mm -hmm. I was I was pretty aggressive in the way that I built it because I assumed I had a limited amount of time. Uh, the assumption was either the snake was going to be found or it was going to be found dead. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and so I certainly didn't expect to go on for, for well over a month. Um, but it was something for me that was very interesting just to kind of be able to see how it would unfold um, and to be able to keep my students in the loop as it was happening uh, in real time. So it was actually quite a bit of fun. And I actually connected with the guy that owns the Cobra. So I'm going to go out there and, and, and actually oh, see you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what, what part of town uh, is he in? Uh, he's just off of um, Apopka Island. Oh, okay. All yeah. I right, gotcha. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the, the story uh, did make national news. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, Florida has a habit of making national news a lot. Um, but yeah. the story was, uh, was, was fun. Uh, because, you know, you have this, well, first, a little scary, because you got this King Cobra that's loose, and mm -hmm. could be potentially dangerous. But then uh, people like Joshua really uh, brought some levity to it and created a persona for this King Cobra. And, <laughs> and King Cobra was, was talking about what he was doing and who he was meeting and, and uh, you know, I guess his positions on certain things. And so it, it, it had a, a life of its own and got kind of fun and, and got a lot of viral traction. And I do think it's a great example uh, that brands can follow too, to jump in on a story. And we saw that mm -hmm. in previous Super Bowls with, with uh, Oreo and, yep. and uh, you know, that was a great example, but being able to be extremely uh, proactive but also reactive in that you can immediately jump into something before the, the story goes stale. And you do that with, with King Cobra. Uh, mm -hmm. Brands can do that with a lot of other things to latch onto something that's trending, but is also uh, relative to their story, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, part of my goal was actually to shed some light on local flavor, local businesses, um, and things that I really enjoyed locally. And what was interesting to me was to see how many businesses did engage and how many didn't engage and, and how many engaged in a way that was just so poor that I couldn't even interact with them. Um, you know, so there were some standouts like the, the folks from Beefy King were super interactive, you know, and they actually had some great opportunities when Jimmy Fallon was in town and went there and they got some exposure from that. Um, but I had several businesses that were just did not engage at all. Um, and, and they may have some different reasons for that. I know a local public, well, actually the Orlando Sentinel uh, reached out to me. Um, they wanted me to have the Cobra appear at the Sentinel. And I said, absolutely, I'd love to do that. 
Um, uh, but of course, I would expect that you would then repost and share um, that image, and they wouldn't agree to it. Um, and so, um, and, and you know, their reasoning was that um, you know, if something were to happen and it turned serious, that you know, it could be an issue for them. And I, and I get that. But you know, asking me to do something for them and not willing to return or reciprocate in any way. You know that that doesn't work, um, yeah. and so I just you know let them know I wouldn't post it, and that was okay. Um, but then you know local news stations were covering it. In fact, Fox uh, 35 uh, did a one of their trending segments on my uh, Instagram account, and so they actually went through and, and talked about it in some of the different places it appeared, and and how it was highlighting local culture, local businesses, local uh, personalities, um, and trying to kind of you know stir that pot a little bit because you want something to good to come from it. Right. I mean, yeah, the, the odds are like, it's not a good situation. I mean, you, whether you're a fan of snakes or not, I mean, I didn't want to see it die. You certainly don't right. want to see it bite somebody or kill somebody's dog mm-hmm. or anything like that. No. Um, and so, you know, at the very least try to make something good come from it while there's an opportunity for it to be a good thing. I so. think, yeah, no, I, I think that was mm-hmm. great. And hopefully uh, uh, it was a very informative lesson to your students at the time. I, I think that they enjoyed it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because they were actually able to follow along in real time. Where the you know the majority of the community didn't know what was going on. In fact, I've had several news uh, folks reach out to me, ask me to to to, to verify that it was actually me that did it, because they couldn't figure it out. And you know, I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm I'm not going to take the time to prove to you. I mean, I, I wrote a blog post. You're welcome to read it. As a professor from a university, for me to just you know make that up would be kind of ridiculous. Of course, I have all of the PSD files from all the horrendous photoshopping that I did. Um, <laughs> but you know, like I'm not I'm not trying to to, to you know do anything with that. Um, but they were really trying to figure it out. Um, you know, and several people had it pegged on other local publications that were doing it. And so it was just kind of fun to mislead and misdirect. And you know, I, I was messing with Jim Hobart and some other people that you know, Wagner. Yes. So. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah and in fact, it was funny, Andrea, that. Uh, Joshua had had come into some of my previous blabs last year in the persona of, of uh, uh, King Cobra, and um, and so I thought that because my my CEO uh, is, uh, is a little bit of a jokester, and and he's been on some of my blabs, and I thought that he was doing that to to egg me on, and so I wasn't buying it. Uh, finally, I, I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna I'm gonna go ahead and block him. I didn't know I was blocking <laughs> Joshua. <laughs> but <That's funny. laughs> Joshua was trying to get back in. I was like, I can't get in. What's going yeah. on? <laughs> so, I was trying. Yeah, but it was it was uh, it was interesting to finally because it, you know I started to learn that he had some of the same he knew some of the same people, but I know my CEO does as well. So I was like, ah, I don't know, it sounded kind of fishy. But mm. um, but yeah, I thought I thought it was very cool. Um, great campaign. I love, I love to see, you know, good stuff like that, um, that goes viral. Uh, you know, one of the things we hear a lot in marketing, um, and I certainly hear a lot at the agency is clients come to, to us and say, I want to, I want to create something. I want it to go viral or I want to create, or I want to create something that's viral, you know, which is even worse. It's like, well, viral isn't uh, virility isn't something that's created. It's something that could be a uh, uh, an outcome of your efforts, but you need to, you need to really create something and, and to produce something that um, like we were talking earlier in this program that is serving the needs wants, uh entertainment value for your audience. Mm-hmm. And if it is, then it has the potential of going viral. And if it doesn't, you can't push it. You, you can't make something go viral. Well, and, and that's the other thing too, is that you can't make something go viral, but you also generally can't sit back and just wait for something to go viral either. You know, like sure. there, there, are, there is work to be done behind the scenes. So, um, you know, I actually, I worked on, on a, a YouTube video that got over 6 million views. Um, and, and that didn't, I mean, like the content is great. You know, the, I think the concept is great. And, and you know, we, we, I mean, we actually filmed it and, and did the whole thing in a very short period of time, um, but ended up with over 6 million views. And that happened because people like George Takai shared it on Facebook. Um, but, he, but, but he didn't just like happen to you know fall upon it. We were sending it to him and other people and trying to get people like that to share it. And mm-hmm. you know, can we control whether they do that? Absolutely not. But can we help them to see that it's there and try to encourage them to do it? Absolutely. Um, and if you get enough of those times where you're able to try to encourage somebody to do it and you're able to get them to actually do it, you know, once he shared it, then we had a whole slew of other celebrities, some of the folks from um, uh, uh, The Big Bang Theory, uh, Mayim Blahnik and, and someone else from that, uh, uh, 
uh, Bill Shatner ended up sharing it. Like, so some other <laughs> people, just, you know, random people that we weren't even reaching out to started sharing it. Um, and then news outlets started picking it up. So, you know, the, the Telegraph and the Guardian and stuff like that, some outlets in Australia and throughout Europe and Asia. Um, and so, you know, people are like, well, that's just magic. It, no, it's, it's not. Like, good marketing isn't magic, right. but it can be magical. You just have to right. make that happen. And some certain, certain things just have to kind of come together for you. I mean, there has to be some level of luck involved with that as well. Oh, sure. I mean, I, I think, yes, you're, you're, you're completely right. I mean, it, it doesn't, it doesn't happen uh, without putting some effort on the front end mm-hmm. and on the ongoing maintenance of it. Absolutely. It's, uh, but I think where luck comes in, into play is when you throw something out there with no planning, no, no management and maintenance of it, and then it goes viral. Well, that's luck. Yeah. And, and that does happen. Yeah, that does yeah. happen. But the majority of the time, especially when you see people repeatedly um, coming up with, with videos that are that sticky or content that is that sticky that's being shared all over the place, that that isn't luck. You know, that that there is a formula to that. Uh, and then you know, it's not to say that the formula will work every time. You know, I mean, even right. if you have the exact same recipe, if you just, you know, bake at a different elevation, that changes. Um, you know, and so there's there's other things that are going on in the area and, and based on certain topics or what's trending, you know, in, in different parts of the world that can all impact whether or not you're going to get that kind of traction. So, yeah, I remember some years back, a uh, former agency that I was with, we did uh, our own Harlem Shake. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, <laughs> we, we were probably uh, maybe a week late from from really. Um, creating something that was really going to get traction. It got some traction, but mm-hmm. not to not to the depth of what it was receiving a few weeks prior, because um, that trend was uh, was something you really had to capitalize at pretty much immediately when it started. And so you look at yeah, you look at the statistic of the news, how long it's going to last in the news cycle, how long it's going to be trending, and what competing sort of subject matter, topic, or new videos come up at that time. So it is. Um, but it's very statistical. Statistically speaking, you can, in general, sort of generalize what um, your response is going to be and do it mathematically so that it's not just guesswork. And mm-hmm. I think that's a lot of what, when they say viral, just mm-hmm. viral, do you know what it means to actually be viral? Because if someone captures something live and then it's by happenstance it becomes viral, the constant sharing of it all, mm-hmm. that is, you said, is luck but to strategically outline the process and to say it. I mean, I remember once um, earlier, we we were playing with headlines and here in Blab and said, you know, there's a Periscope summit in London. And then people started asking, where is this summit? It is non-existent, you know, but to actually put it out there is strategic. We can say, hey, there's a Periscope summit in London. Who's speaking there? No clue. It's just, Mm -hmm. we wanted to see what type of traction and testing, the constant testing of headlines and interest and the influencers that are connected with it. And like you said in your article, the hashtags capitalizing on trends, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, make the story yours. And Mm -hmm. I, well, and so one of the things that um, I noticed and, and talk about kind of capitalizing on luck and, and seeing opportunity, um, when uh, Dwight Howard, who was, was a huge and still totally recognizable here in Orlando, he started following my account. You know, he's got a couple million followers. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I was driving to a meeting and all of a sudden I got a notification that says, Dwight Howard's not following you. I was like, yeah, you know, it's probably some somebody else's account. And I looked <laughs> at it, it's like, no, no, two point something million followers, followers, and he, and he was following three or 400 accounts. Right. Like, oh, no, that's legit. So, so the first thing I did, I had some images, and by the way, all of my photoshopping is, is absolutely horrendous. I'd never used Photoshop until this whole thing started. Um, but I was on my way to a meeting, and the guy that I was meeting was running late. And so I took 15 minutes while I was waiting for my next meeting to create my next image, which was directly targeted towards Dwight Howard. Mm-hmm. And to kind of antagonize him a little bit too, you know, <laughs> because, because if I could get him to interact with me, if I get him to repost or to interact or do anything like that had huge potential, you know, right. but I wasn't putting all my eggs in that basket and, and just saying, okay, I'm going to keep swinging for the fences. Every now and then those opportunities would come up and I would, and I would try to take them. But the growth and the, the success that that account had was from just the daily grind of getting things done, showing up um, and putting in the effort and being really diligent about what I was trying to accomplish. Right. 
That's cool. Very focused. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I remember the first time I got some, someone cool following me. It was, I think, the voice of Siri. And I stopped on the side of the road and it said, the voice of Siri? The voice of Siri is following me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Siri, do you know you're following me? It was amazing. You know, and just, <laughs> it's just that uh, recognizing that there are people that add value to your sort of presence. Mm -hmm. and, so the respondent said, Siri, I do not understand why you are following me. <laughs> no, she's like, well, it's my job, Andrea. <laughs> but you know, a lot of times the reaction is, um, like I've, I've seen uh, businesses, for example, that they were interacting with, with my various accounts that I have, and they just get mm -hmm. all super excited, like, yay, you know, um, the Lake Yola is following me, or, you know, um, the Cobra's following me, or, wh or whatever that might be. And there, there's no call to action. Like they don't give me, they don't make it easy for me to try to then help them because I, I'm, I'm all about doing that. And they may not know that, but they, they just get like kind of locked up in, in the momentary excitement without saying, okay, what can I do now that might provide value back to that, that mm -hmm. might then in turn generate more value that could come back to me, you know? Right. Um, and, and instead it's just, oh yeah, that's cool. And they kind yeah. of move on. I'm like, wow, like I, I totally, would promote you know whatever you're doing or within you know certain reasons um yeah. but so well, many of the opportunities were just missed some, like some if they put it a, put a picture that was sort of what, sorry they put a picture that was photoshopped and you mm -hmm. could retweet it for them right or you know respond but what are you going to do but like something but, or you know um, favorite something if they say hey thanks for following me okay favorite. right that's it right. Yep. So stops there well, yep. Joshua, were you the one that was saying that you had uh, that your wife is a professional blogger? Or was it somebody yeah. else? Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I don't know when she when she got into it if she had a um, if she had a plan um, that she had kind of laid out. Or I, I know you said that she was hopeful. Oh, that's it. Okay, cool. I'll check it out. You, you got me. I have a lot of homework after this blab is done. I know <laughs> article reading everything. I have, a lot to, I have a lot to do because I've opened up multi tabs on everything you just provided. <laughs> Um, but did, did she have a written out plan, almost like a business plan of timeline and everything of when she was going to get to monetization or was she just kind of going through the motions? Not initially. So initially it started out, it was just a hobby. Uh, and then eventually she lost her job and then she put the energy into figuring out what she was going to do with it and realized that that was going to be her next path. Um, and so, um, I, I don't think, uh, she started it before we were married or before we were dating. Um, uh, I don't think that there was a, uh, a very thorough written out plan, um, mm -hmm. but she knew very early on that there were numerous ways that you could potentially monetize a blog, um, looking at sponsored posts and looking at, um, ad revenue from banner ads, mm -hmm. uh, you know, product placements and things like that. So she didn't necessarily know, um, specifically what was going to work best for her. Um, but she knew there was a lot of things she could try. And, and she also knew that it was very important for her to build her audience before trying to, to, to do that. And so that was her, her focus was on building the audience originally with the intention of monetizing, but with having ideas of how that could and would likely be able to happen versus now what I'm seeing a lot of is people who are going after becoming a celebrity and just the, 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 the Facebook mentality or the Instagram mentality of I'll just get all the users and then I'm going to be worth a ton of money you know, because people mm -hmm. are going to want to get to them. Um, right. and, and, you know, I talk to people about this all the time. Um, I, I have a regular conversations with people on Instagram that have really big followings and they're extremely talented photographers. And I really admire their work, but then I'm sitting back and I'm thinking as a, if what brand would I need to be to work with them? You know, because they go out and they shoot the things that they love to shoot and these really cool cityscapes and all this kind of stuff. And I, and I'm, and I struggle to think of a, a good solid list of brands or companies that would make sense to work with them. You know, obviously some camera companies, maybe some travel companies, um, but they're, they're somewhat limited. Um, and even among all of those, those companies that exist in those two fields, they're limited among those because of the type of photography that they do. Um, rather than thinking about how you can be commercialized, you know, we, we think about the idea of arts, for example, from, you know, the, the hippy dippy artist and, you know, I create the things that come to my mind and then people are going to want those things versus a commercialized artist who makes a really strong living and can knock a home run every now and then, um, they can do it consistently, you know, rather than somebody who happens to become the famous artist, you know, three weeks before they die and then super famous a month after they die. Um, mm -hmm. and meanwhile, having been poor their entire life. Right. Um, and so it's really thinking about what makes sense and, and what the revenue models might actually look like and how you can implement those. Even if you're not doing that now, 
um, when I was, I was talking with, with somebody the other day and I was, I was saying, you know, if you want to get in travel uh, photography, then that's great. Um, you know, think about it. If you were the city of Orlando or, or visit Orlando, for example, mm-hmm. um, why would I, why would I work with you if, if I'm visit Orlando and you have your account? Because all you do is you just showcase your great photography, but you haven't told me a story. Like you've got some quirky captions and some great shots, but you haven't told me a story at all about being in Orlando or about the venues that you visited or the hotels you stayed at or the restaurants you went to or the, the sites that you saw. You just have some really incredible photography. Um, mm-hmm. But a, a travel agency or a, you know a, a, a visit Orlando type group, a destination agency is they're going to want you to be able to tell a story, and you're not doing that. And yes. you know when they just happen to find you, they need to see that you're capable of doing that um, rather than just taking some really cool pictures. Yeah, you want to look at a, an image and feel the emotion behind it. Um, mm-hmm. we, we talk about it at the agency all the time that a uh, great uh, commercial creative and, and commercial graphic design is is uh, something that tells a story mm-hmm. even before you add headline and body copy to it. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. You should be able to tell the story. So, yes, it, I, I completely agree with you. And actually, that's a good segue for uh, the last thing that I was going to kind of bring up. Um, I, that's not, not on this, uh, entrepreneur article, but I wanted to bring it up because it's something we hear year after year as the, the ongoing trend, which is content. We've heard content is king, um, uh, content generation, content curation, content creation, and I'm going to set it up this way. And then I, I want to hear both of your, your points of view on this. Um, we hear a lot of people talking about, what they do as building content. Uh, if I'm if I'm on a blab or not my own blab, but if I'm listening to somebody's blab, I uh, hear them talking about how they're producing content. I go um, to you know listen to somebody speak or webinar. They're talking about producing content. Uh, somewhere else, it's about content. It's gotten to the point for me where I feel that. The, the word content is starting to become a dirty word that mm. um, and that that I, I almost don't want to hear the word content anymore. I rather I rather hear someone say that they are producing a show that's going to bring inherent value to their audience and about these kind of topics. And I'm going to take it to an angle that nobody else is talking about. Or I'm going to write some blog posts that um, – answer a challenge or or help solve some problems that people are looking for some something to me i just feel like that sounds more sincere than all these people blabbing about and i don't mean blabbing as in on blab but in general talk talking about i i'm a content generation i got to create good content i got to create good content and no i me personally i think no what you need to do is you need to be real you need to be sincere and I, I don't know, wait, before I, I, I start blabbering on, what do you guys think? <laughs> um, okay, so I, I'll say this a lot. Content is king has been the general mindset for the past 10 years, <laughs> you know? And it's aggravating to say the least, <clears throat> excuse me. But my mindset here is if content was king, then direction and strategy and implementation are heir apparent mm-hmm. or the upcoming year. So it's not just about content. Everybody has content. I mean, for goodness sakes, there's um, hubs of thousand plus articles that you can download for free. That's content. And there's a million plus freelancers or you can pay five dollars for a good piece of content, you know, Mm -hmm. but content alone does absolutely nothing. You have to have a direction, you have to have a strategy and you have to actually do it. Mm -hmm. You're not doing any of that, then what happens? nothing you know right content is is an important component um mm-hmm. but you know i can i can sit back well maybe not me but some people can sit back and write the most pr- profound blog posts and and thought provoking and, and and valuable um but then they don't know how to market it and no one ever sees it and no one cares mm-hmm. you know um, because the idea is well if i just produce great content then everyone's going to love it they're going to eat it up and they won't they won't be able to stop themselves from sharing it and talking about it um, so content is important, but value is what's even more important. And value is something that's easy to, that should be easy to communicate, um, and it should be easy to get people to share and to engage um, and to create di- dialogue around the value that you're creating. Simply creating content for the sake of creating content is a death spiral. 
I think that's very well put. And that that's that I think is my my pain point in the subject is I've seen um, a lot of social media celebrities, if you will, that have amassed such a following and especially on, on new platforms like Periscope and Meerkat, uh, as well as on Twitter. And I, I hear them speak. And uh, these are people that um, you may know, you may have, have encountered, and they're people that a lot of brands approach now because they're considered influencers. And it's, it's interesting to, to hear them speak about what they're doing in terms of content generation, how they're creating content. And, and I guess it's just the way in which they're talking about it that makes me feel like they're missing that main component, which is providing value. Mm-hmm. Like you said, are they so focused on the fact that they're content generators and not the fact that they should be um, providing value? And hey, you know, in some cases, you know, that value is just entertainment. It's not even educational. It's just, yeah. you know. In, in many of those cases. It's, it's entertainment, <laughs> and, that, yeah. and that value, and that value is, is highly questionable in my mind. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, and, and another thing is when you get so wrapped up in content and, and the creation of it, the value of it, I think, goes away as well, um, you know, because it becomes such a push to create and to get out. And the the focus that I think needs to be on the, the, the value of the actual content um, that's created, you know, whenever you publish that, um, that goes away because, well, I just have to publish something, you know, and I see this, um, you know, with people who are trying to make it big on Instagram, you know, like, well, I, I have to publish, you know, something, at, you know, 730 this morning. And, you know, it's not my, my best work, but I just had to put something up. No, you don't. You don't. Um, you know, I, and 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 the part of it is that it's amazing is that um, we as individuals and, and marketers and and uh, influencers, whatever, are so convinced that everyone like just hinges, like their day doesn't start until they see my morning post on Instagram or my morning blab or my morning tweet or my morning Periscope or whatever. Like no one's life starts until I start and do that for them, and then they can go on. Then <laughs> all is right with the world. You know, um, and it's that thought, that 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 mentality that is forcing people to just. I mean, I, I I'm not a periscoper at all. Um, I have it on my iPhone. I don't carry my iPhone. I, it stays at my house most of the time. Um, but every now and then I pick it up and I see what some of these periscopes are, are called or the titles of them. Of you know, my fight with some so and so boyfriend or whatever. I'm like. I don't understand who would open that and want to watch that. Um, but I get that there, there are people, you know, yes. but again, the more of those people that we're talking about, the people who they are trying to, they're trying to get celebrity. They're not trying to build a business, you know, and they don't understand the difference yes. because there is a difference. There are plenty of broke celebrities, both in the YouTube and, and Instagram world, as well as the everyday entertainment world. You know, MC Hammer was once famous and rich. Mm-hmm. Now everyone knows his name and he has no money. Right. Yeah. Um, and so in, in his case, he made it and lost it. But in a lot of cases, there, there's artists that everyone knows, you know, they're, they're they have hits on the radio and they're barely they're barely making rent, you know, um, and that kind of stuff happens all the time. And, and artists of all kinds and, and content producers of all kinds from all platforms and, and walks of life uh, with movie producers and music producers and, and TV and everywhere, um, they get so focused on creating the amount of content they think they need. And they start losing sight of the quality and the value that that's supposed to create. And that's, that's bad news. Yeah. You know, I think that, I think that some of us have forgotten um, why social media platforms even came to fruition or why self social networking even came to fruition. It was to be social. It was to have fun without a preconceived agenda and to just be yourself uh, on an online platform as you would offline in your in your regular communities and because many have then chosen to take those platforms into some type of an initiative some business or marketing initiative and mm-hmm. have been reading all these articles out there about you got to create content and this is how you do inbound marketing and if mm-hmm. you do x amount of um articles with with these top keywords and if you if you do this then you're going to drive more traffic and you have to do it this regularly so then i think a lot of people have been following all this which some of it's great advice but Mm -hmm. they become so mechanical Mm -hmm. that they've they've lost the the true essence of what social media is about it's like hey listen yes these are really good mechanics for you to keep in mind but the Mm -hmm. first thing you should think about is be yourself be sincere i i do these blabs because 
I love what I do. If I didn't, I wouldn't be doing it just to drive traffic and build my personal brand. Um, I'd be doing something else, but I, I really enjoy it. And I want to give back um, to the community with, uh, with topics that, um, that I think are interesting and I'd love to hear from them and engage. But I, I do it from a real place first. Uh, and if it builds my personal brand, great. I have, a, I have a website. I have a lot of other destinations. People can go to learn more. But, you know, that wasn't the, the first reason. It's kind of like uh, I came from the music business, as I think you might know, Joshua. I don't know. But I was in the music business for a long period of time. And I, I, I've been on a panel at some conferences being asked the question of musicians about, you know, what they need to do to monetize and blah, blah, blah. And I keep telling them the first thing you need to be focused on is, you know, do you enjoy what you're doing? Are you having fun? Are you being real with your music? That's the first thing. Then, then let's talk about what you need to do now to monetize it. But if you're not starting there first, if you're starting from a platform of like, oh, I got to create music that makes money, then you're not going to be successful. You need to create music that you believe in, you're passionate about, connects with people, and then find ways to connect it to money. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. If you're so my from. It's a totally against the capitalist perspective of just do what you're passionate about and let it make you money. But and the and in contrast is sort of what's happening right now. And if you want to be a capitalist and you don't want to put in work, you just want to invest in someone, then that's sort of a different um, vein of thinking, and that's perfectly fine. But when you're trying to build something from something you're passionate about and to make money eventually, right? The process is to do something that you can add value to you can be of service to someone and you're just not sort of cookie cutter um you got some different sort of icing <laughs> on your cookie it's interesting to someone and it serves people in a very unique way and people often forget that especially the fact that there's so much content out here on blogging on seo on social media optimization and on how to pre-schedule and automate and run your business as a one-man team and everyone can get rich tomorrow or in a year from now and you're going to be doing something just because you believe this niche is profitable because you did the seo research doesn't really make sense if you have no idea about that topic one and if you are not even passionate about it because how can you add value to that topic or to that existing market we have no experience and no concern for it and, and I hear somebody's got lots of periscopes that are just inviting you to, to come in. <laughs> somebody's yeah. periscope is whistling. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, it's it's um, the fact that I should always turn off my phone. Um, <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> I thought it was, it was funny and it connected with our periscope. It's funny. Yeah. And there's the elusive oh. Rocco. Rocco. Up, How y'all doing? Joshua, what's going on? How you doing? Joshua, hey. Rocco, you guys know each other already? No. no? Okay, well, there you go. Rocco, oh, Joshua, <laughs> Joshua, Rocco. Um, Rocco um, can probably introduce himself better than I can, but um, he's, uh, he's a... Uh, he, he's a rapper that that um, that sense or utilizes rap and song to deliver his spiritual message and uh, in a very positive, uplifting message. And he, he uses... Uh, music as the vehicle by which that message uh, connects with people. I think, did I say that correctly? <laughs> yeah, you, you're, you're very eloquent with your words. Wagner. <laughs> yeah, well, man. I, okay, so I, I just walked back. Okay, I, I love to walk. Okay, Walking is one of my favorite activities ever. Okay, so I get a lot of thinking, meditating. I listen to audio books. I engage in really good conversation while I walk. Uh, so I walked to the the mayor, we have a new mayor in Houston, and um, that's one of my uh, my segues and venues of how I was able to position myself into an authority sort of level on my industry is by collaborating with my city. And on my way back from performing at the pre-inauguration party, I, I walk back and I'm hyped up off the performance, right? And then I come up with a lot of different uh, revelations, and I hopped, I hopped in here when you were talking about being authentic. Wagner and and I really I mean we can get caught up so much in all the the formulaic and very standardized type of ways of marketing and doing business but I think one of the most special things that an entrepreneur or a business owner can really um, embark on is the the joy of the journey uh, and the discovery you see as children 
we we always want to discover we're always so curious we want to learn something new we're like oh what is this and oh and it creates this excitement and uh what i realized is we have to learn how to trust our spirit and our intuition and and and, and always be willing to learn always learn uh you know take everything it, I always say, eat it and then spit out the bones, you know, whatever applies to you, apply it. But a lot of times we get so distracted by so many different opinions. For example, um, I have a grant that I'm applying for. It's for $45,000 and it's for a grant to, uh, to utilize art to encourage tourism in the city of Houston. And I made it for the finals there and I'm, I'm part of the top three. And I, they, they asked us to make a video to, uh, to express, our involvement with the city of Houston and why we are qualified for this particular grant. And so I decided to make a video and I made a video and I shared it with specific people that I trust. You see, Andrea was one, you know, did I share my video with you, Wagner? You did. Huh? Okay. Yeah. So I shared it with specific individuals on blab because I knew that I'd had no emotional attachment to them because I, I mean, yeah, we get along and yeah, we care, but they don't know me for who I am, really. They, they only will see it from the perspective of a professional. And so we all have a stillness of a voice that tells us and encouraged us to embark on this entrepreneurial journey in life. And whatever business or whatever brand we represent, that's what encourages us to leave a job or to, to leave a person that you're in a bad relationship with. You have this stillness of a voice that, that really guides us. And I would just encourage everybody to walk to the, the heartbeat, you know, dance to the rhythm of your own personal heartbeat, because it really does. I mean, some of the most unconventional ways of marketing will come out of you and you'll be like, I have no clue why this is coming out of me right now. And nobody else is doing this. And I know if I told somebody this, they'd be like, you're crazy. But guess what? It works. And that's when the magic truly happens. You know, eat the meat, spit out the bones always be willing to learn, always be cognizant of how you feel because your attitude is the most important thing in running a business. And dude, I love the four trends that will shape our marketing in 2016. I read over them a couple of times and I love the fact that we have tools. We are living in one of the most exciting times as entrepreneurs because not only can I talk to people from all around the world on a, on a damn screen right here, like I'm just like, this is <laughs> unreal to me, you know what I mean? Like, it's so unreal how I develop relationships from all around the world. We have free platforms to express our message, you know, and that's why I'm so, so fervently excited to encourage people to share your message because you can hop on camera, hop on a microphone and then share it for free. Imagine if YouTube or Vimeo was charging, like, imagine if we had to pay like $300 a month, right? I mean, for real, this is free stuff, blab free and then you have all these optimizing tools and analysis tools like exactly what you were saying and everybody's on their cell phone i would take full advantage of it right now and just talk your ass off <laughs> <laughs> you know what's free. interesting yeah i was thinking about Rocco's thought when he said just um like the fearlessness of being who you are spreading your message and trusting that intuition that gut feeling to become a great marketer is like become your real self, your true person. And I was watching, or a friend and I was talking about it, and I was watching my children. And some children, they're fearless. Like they want something, they know they want it, they're gonna go get it, right? right. They know they're gonna get it. And they have this this zero restriction. So it's like zero wireframe, zero, zero fences, zero um, restraints for themselves in their mind that says, I want this, I'm going to get it. And I always say this for myself is that um, anything I want, anything I want with the nod up and down, anything I want, I'll, I can get, you know, because I want it. So the object or the sort of hurdle that we have to cross is defining how it is that we're going to get there and keep going and keep changing as it changes, as the trends go up and down, as we hit peaks and valleys. We have to really be cognizant that if we really want it, we're going to get it. But it's not going to be like everybody else gets it because everyone else is very different, you know. We all, we'll, we'll, all, we'll drive a different car and we'll get to a, a different def destination. It just yeah. depends on your GPS, your goals, your systems, <laughs> and your, your 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 goals, your processes, and your and systems. Your system. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, I definitely would love to see more authenticity in 2016. I think that if um, if people that 
consider themselves to be or in the business of being content generators or curators of, of some sort uh, because of uh, the way in which they monetize or, or because it connects to something else. If, if that's part of their business model, uh, I think that it, an important message in 2016 is don't forget about why you're doing it in the first place. And hopefully the reason why isn't just because of the end means of monetization, but it's because you really enjoy uh, and you're very uh, relevant and sincere about what you're putting out there. And, uh, you know, make sure that you're thinking value, uh, like Joshua pointed out earlier, you're thinking value before you, this commitment to pushing out any kind of content. You know? Oh, dude, I've 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 met you before, Joshua. You have a really cool uh like movement about homelessness, right? Yeah. Hold on a second. Let me read your profile. Hold on. <laughs> oh yeah, I met you. Before. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. interesting, Joshua. I know someone who's really um doing something very interesting in terms of homelessness. Um, really? Very. Maybe I maybe I'll um sort of connect with you. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the, the Where are you based out of, Joshua? Orlando, Florida. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so the, my video, the video that I mentioned earlier was a video on homelessness um, that went viral. Hard, hard boats, hey, that, that really resonates with me, Joshua, because I was physically homeless for two years, and I was, you know, spiritually homeless for twenty-eight years. <laughs> yeah. It's my first home, baby. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> and a beautiful one it is. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, I admire what you do, man. Um, homelessness is uh, is definitely a, a, a state of mind. Um, and, 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 you know, we, we just need to encourage people to to reframe and rewire um, the perspective of acknowledging that there are resources out there uh, and, and hope, you know, like whether you have a criminal record or whether you you've uh, you've gone through a lot it's it's very it's very much a mindset thing and man i live right next I, I purposely picked this location not only because of the address which is 2016 main but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, i live right next to uh, the greyhound station and there are tons of homeless people out here and uh one of the reasons why i picked this location because it's almost like the tale of two cities you know on one side it's like a lot of CEOs and business owners. And on the other side, it's a lot of homeless people and it allows me to, uh, to give back. So on every Friday I go out and I give back to the homeless people and, and talk with them. A lot of times they just need somebody to talk to. So I go out there and talk and, uh, and it reminds me to stay humble and remember where I came from because I don't ever want to forget that, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. I admire what you do, brother, man. Peace. Word up. Word up. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, listen, I'm going to I'm going to wrap up the recording. Doesn't mean you guys don't have to stick around because uh, we can have a little chat afterwards, but I'm going to wrap it up. It's been a lot of fun. This um, this show uh, on, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Sunday night, we typically uh, do our website audit, the what's wrong with my website. And uh, on occasion, uh, Andreas uh, has uh, offered to to come in as a co-host with me. Um, but uh, maybe not every Sunday, so I don't want you guys to get all excited. You're going to see her every Sunday, <laughs> but uh, maybe more than less. Um, mm -hmm. And then, I'll, and and hopefully, I'll see uh, Joshua and Rocco there as well, and and the rest of you. But um, our program uh, program schedule for 2016 is Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, and Thursdays at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then Sunday, we do that program at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. So uh, thank you all. Thank you, everybody that uh, joined us uh, from the beginning and later on in the show on Blab. And also for all of you guys watching this recording, um, be sure to visit brandblab.live, which is the website. It has all uh, past episodes, insightful blog posts that we call Brand Blog, and more. And... Um, We'll see you next time.